Hi guys, my name is Noni Gazimbi, and today I'll be presenting on familial Mediterranean fever. Familial Mediterranean fever, otherwise known as FMF, is an inherited non-infectious disorder. FMF episodes start before the age of 20 years in approximately 90% of patients, and in about 75% of patients, fever appears before the age of 10 years. Generally, FMF affects people of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern descent, typically Sephatic Jews, Turks, Arabs, and Armenians. It has also been diagnosed in individuals of Italian, Greek, Ashkenazi, Jew, and Asian ancestry. Approximately 1 in 200 to 1,000 people in these populations is affected. FMF is caused by recessive gene variants on the MEFV gene. Inheritance pattern is typically autosomal recessive. Children must inherit two abnormal copies of the MEFV gene, one from each parent. In rare cases, autosomal dominant is often seen in those who inherit the mutation from one affected parent. MEF gene, MEFV V gene provides instructions for making a protein called pyrin found in white blood cells, which plays a role in the natural control of inflammation. In addition, there is an SAA1 gene, which um, is normal variations may modify the course of FMF. According to the evidence reported by the U.S. National Library of Medicine, a particular version of the SAA1 gene called the alpha variant increases the risk of amyloidosis among people with FMF, and we'll talk a, lot, a bit more about amyloidosis later. Clinical presentation. The most common symptoms include episodic fever, often with pain in the abdomen, joints, or chest. Um, things to note are not all affected individuals will all have will have all the symptoms, and symptoms may change over time. Episodes usually last one to three days and go away without treatment. Most individuals look and feel healthy between episodes, but some may have such frequent episodes they do not fully recover or do not grow properly. Patients may have a red rash over the lower extremities, usually near the ankles and feet. Severe abdominal pain may look like appendicitis. There have also been occasional reports of chest pain. Typically, joint swelling resolves over 5 to 14 days, but sometimes may become chronic. Rarely, individuals have recurrent pericarditis, myositis, meningitis, or orchitis. Children less than 5 years old may have episodes of recurrent fever without other symptoms. There are two phenotypes to discuss in relation to FMF, FMF type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is characterized by recurrent short episodes of inflammation and serositis, fever, peritonitis, synovitis, pleuritis, rarely pericarditis and meningitis, but um, amyloidosis, which can lead to renal failure and is the most severe complication um, of untreated FMF. FMF type 2 is characterized by amyloidosis as the first clinical manifestation and is usually seen in an otherwise asymptomatic individual. Other rare clinical manifestations of note include protracted febrile myalgia, erysipelas like erythema, vasculitides, recurrent urticaria, aseptic meningitis, reduced fertility, decreased ATP, and chronic ascites. The diagnostic criteria um, include the tel hashimer clinical criteria and molecular genetic testing. One thing to note is infection, trauma, strenuous and exercise, menstrual periods, or psychological stress may trigger episodes of fever in FMF. Back to the diagnostic criteria, the tel Hashimer clinical criteria is one that is used on a um, regular basis, and we'll touch a little bit more on that on the next slide. Diagnosis is still based on symptoms and physical examination by the physician. A six-month trial of colchicine therapy may estab can establish diagnoses. 
If these molecular genetic tests are positive, the diagnosis of FMF is definite. It is possible to have FMF and have a defect in just one gene or none at all. In the United States, more than 30% of the patients do not have mutations in both genes. The tal hashimer clinical criteria state that um, for diagnosis, an individual needs to have fever and one additional major feature and one minor feature or fever and two minor features. Major features include fever, abdominal pain, chest pain, joint pain, and skin eruption. Minor features include increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate, leukocytosis, and elevated serum fibrinogen concentration. Management. Current management strategies and considerations include colchicine as the first line, which is an anti-gout agent. Colchicine prevents episodes from starting, but does not treat an acute episode. If colchicine is taken regularly, the vast majority of affected individuals can live a normal life with a normal life expectancy. Common side effects of the medication include abdominal pain and diarrhea. Other side effects include nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps, rarely muscle weakness, decreased white blood cell count, red blood cell and platelet counts, and mild elevations in liver enzymes. Children or individuals taking colchicine grow normally. It is appropriate in, press, in, breast, in pregnancy and breastfeeding, but amniocentesis is recommended. Children treated with colchicine should have blood tests, which include acute phase reactants, complete blood counts, chemistry, liver and renal panel, and others, and urine tests at least twice yearly, urine tests to look for protein urea. About 10% of patients do not respond or can't tolerate colchicine. Um, so these individuals receive medications that block interleukin, such as Arcalist, Kinneret, and Ilaris, which may be effective in that non-responsive um, population. Other considerations are um, with lifelong for lifelong treatment of colchicine. Um, it is recommended in individuals who are homozygotes um, and compound heterozygotes for the pathogenic variant P.MET694VAL. Homozygous or compound heterozygous P.GLU148GLN should only be treated with colchicine if they develop um, severe inflammatory episodes or proteinuria due to amyloidosis. And symptomatic individuals with, who, with a heterozygous um, MEFV pathogenic variant may benefit from colchicine trial. Acute phase management. As noted above, um, colchicine does not treat um, acute phase FMF flare-ups. So supportive care is recommended in this time. This includes intravenous saline for hydration, NSAIDs for inflammation, and acetaminophen or dipyrone for pain relief and antipyretic effects. Complications. The most severe complication is amyloidosis. Amyloid is a protein that deposits in the organs due to chronic inflammation. It is seen frequently in affected Jews of North African origin. Amyloid is com commonly deposits in the kidney but can extend to intestines, skin, and heart. A buildup of amyloid causes a loss of function in whatever affected um, organ. Amyloidosis in the kidney is seen by high levels of protein in the urine. This may result in further complications of, of kidney failure leading to dialysis or kidney transplant. If properly treated with colchicine, which blocks amyloid from depositing in organs, individuals are safe from the risk of developing this life-threatening complication. Prevention is key. Stopping treatment, even for a short while, can allow amyloidosis to occur. 
There are ethical, financial, and social considerations. Socially, psychological support is necessitated to help individuals cope with this disease that has lifelong implications. In addition, we also have to provide caregiver support as they are the ones who help their loved one manage the disease process. Um, FMF has a psychosocial impact on families as it disrupts the family system. And for these individuals, there are online support groups available, such as SED Support, Rare Connect, and Nomad Alliance. Financially, genetic testing is not cheap. On average, it costs between $100 to $2,000. For FMF, there's the FMF mutation analyses, and it may or may not be covered by health insurance, and this is all dependent on whether it is ordered by a physician. There are also other costs to consider, costs to treat symptoms in the, in the acute phase and also to treat complications. These are costs that the families incur, and also there are costs within families to care for affected individuals. Individuals. Ethically, for parents, as the healthcare practitioner, we need to determine their genetic risk, class, clarify their carrier status, and provide information so that they can make an informed decision. We can discuss prenatal testing for FMF affected or carrier patients. Prenatal testing is available, although ethical concerns arise if testing is being used to determine termination of pregnancy. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is available for in vitro fertilization. Lastly, as a provider, it is essential for us to offer genetic testing for two first-degree relatives. Thank you guys. That is my entire presentation. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.